Stephen Kocher, missing from St. George, Utah. Stephen was from Texas, and he'd been living in St. George. The 30-year-old man was excited for the future, but the plans he had derailed pretty quickly. He had by then graduated from college with a degree in communications. The financial crisis hit in 2007, and then a recession started. So in the spring of 2009, things were tough for Stephen, and he was doing all that he could to find employment. He got a job in marketing, but unfortunately he lost that shortly after he was hired. His family would say, though, that he remained pretty positive while this was happening, pretty sure that he would be able to get a new job. But despite him seeming like he was pretty positive about the future, he just disappeared. We do know that he found part-time employment, handing out flyers for a window washing company, but it wasn't enough to live on. On December 10, 2009, Stephen stopped by his ex-girlfriend's house in Ruby Valley, Nevada. She wasn't home, but her family was, and they invited him in for lunch. But he would say he couldn't stay as he was on his way to visit his family in Sacramento, and he was concerned about the weather. It wasn't true, though. He doesn't even have family in Sacramento. By December 10th, Stephen was three months behind on his rent, and his landlord called his father to try to facilitate being able to get paid for the rent. He had listed his father on his rental application. This was extremely upsetting for Stephen. He told his father that he was behind on the rent and that he wasn't answering his calls. Stephen's father kept calling from him, and Stephen finally did answer when he was inside of a grocery store. His grandmother had written a check for the back rent, and Stephen's pride was hurt, and he became pretty angry, and he hung up on his father. He followed up the exchange a few days later, saying he's got it under control, and he's able to pay the rent on his own now. Stephen talked to one of his siblings the next day also. To none of those people did he mention he was taking a road trip, much less why. His mom spoke to him after that, saying she transferred money into his account. He seemed to be fine during that phone call, and he apologized for overreacting before. Yet he never told her he was on the road. It's unknown exactly where he went, but phone pings would show he drove over 1,000 miles those previous few days and then was back at work. It's known he went to Salt Lake City and Springfield, Utah, among other destinations. He arrived back home on the 10th. On December 12th, at about 9 p.m., his cell phone would ping near Overton, which is about 90 minutes away from his home. The next ping happened in Mesquite, Nevada. Then, by 8 p.m. that night, he was back home in St. George. One known stop was that he went to a Walmart and bought gifts for his niece and nephew. This was at 8 p.m. A few hours later, he returned home though it's not clear where he went between Walmart at 8 p.m. and home around 10 p.m. Once he was home, he didn't stay there, however. The neighbors would report that he came home for only a short time and he left again. That morning of December 13th, a friend from the town of St. George would call him at about 9 a.m. and ask him to attend a church meeting. Stephen is described as being very involved in the church. He responded that he couldn't do so, as he was in Las Vegas. He offered to go back if it was important, but the man explained he too was in Las Vegas, and that was why he wanted Stephen to attend the meeting. So he declined the offer, saying he could go back from Vegas himself. And while the cell phone ping showed he ended up in Vegas, no one knows why. A few other members from his church would call in the next few hours, as he was supposed to officiate his service, but he told them he wouldn't make it. His next ping show up in Henderson, Nevada. For anyone unaware, Henderson is just outside of Las Vegas. I've actually passed through St. George, Utah myself on a road trip to Vegas, and he hadn't gone terribly far as you can see here. St. George to Las Vegas isn't an abnormal trip, and St. George and Mesquite are even closer. It's unknown if he was gambling or delivering something or exactly what it was he was doing. Obviously, Las Vegas is a great place to gamble, but Stephen was apparently a pretty devout Mormon, and so it might be more likely that he was delivering something as opposed to gambling, and some more evidence of this would come up 
shortly after. On that same day, December 13, 2009, Stephen was seen on a home surveillance video parking his white 2003 Chevy Cavalier. He parked it at the end of an upscale retirement community located in Henderson, Nevada, around 11.54 a.m. They have footage from a couple different cameras that day, and it shows Stephen exiting the car and walking away. But he returned a short time later to retrieve something from his car. That was the last time he was seen. The fact he left, came back, and got something, and left again, makes me think he was probably checking if someone was home and came back to get whatever it was he was to deliver. But that's just my personal opinion. By the time he came back to his car and left again, it was six minutes later. Some of the witnesses would say he exited the car with something that looked a lot like a file folder. The second camera facing the street caught him walking toward a home, and he was seen walking north and crossing the street. Someone in the HOA noted that his car was still there the next day and that someone from the HOA contacted his family. According to another source, the police were contacted by the HOA four days later, and it was them who contacted the family. That is the problem with a lot of these stories. Things conflict from news account to news account, and it's hard to know. But if I were to guess, we know the flyers were located in the back of his car. My guess is the HOA called the employer who owned those flyers. And that was how the family was contacted. Because there's some indication that they moved on it and were looking for him quicker than the four-day claim along with the police. It stated that the employer referred them to the family. And in return, they were alerted that there was a problem. The parents would immediately go to the site and begin looking for him. By Christmas, the police too were searching. And there were searches of them in the surrounding desert by helicopter and all-terrain vehicles, but it turned up nothing. It appears the police have a good idea where he was going, based on what could be seen in the footage of where he was walking. A police report indicated they saw him speaking to a person, and that person would later proclaim they don't recognize Stephen or know him. The neighbor went so far as to state they don't trust anyone due to the drug lifestyle of the people living in that area. They would say that they don't have any friends in the area, and, and this was supposed to imply to the police that he couldn't know Stephen because he didn't know anyone who lived in the area. Years later, an interview, which can be found in the description below, a neighbor spoke anonymously to a local TV station, and there's some indication it's the neighbor who was originally questioned by the police. That neighbor claimed Stephen went to his home, knocked, and had left by the time the man opened the door saying he could see Stephen on the other side of the street. He then allegedly proclaimed the man, said, I need money, saying Stephen was walking on the other side of the street with no sidewalk at the time when he said it. The neighbor claims he didn't speak to him, he just closed the door. When the police questioned him originally, the police would note there was evidence of something big having happened inside his house. There had been a lot of sound complaints for this specific home. The police would also say there had been a lot of complaints about people coming and going. When the police had arrived at the home itself to question the man, they would note the furniture in the living room was all gone. There were holes in the walls and other damage visible to the officers. If he explained to the police why this was the case, it's not noted. That specific house was noted as having unusual traffic the day Stephen went missing. A different news account states that Stephen was going door-to-door -door looking for someone specific, so I'm not actually sure exactly which is true. It is known, though, that after Stephen went missing, the first ping indicated it was a few miles north of where his car was found, in what is described as a really rough neighborhood. That ping happened at 5 p.m. It pinged again about two hours later, and it was another two miles from where that first ping happened. It would then continue to ping off a tower near US-95 and Russell Road for three days until the phone's battery died, all pretty close to where his car was found. But there is zero proof that Stephen was ever at either of those locations or if someone else had his phone. The investigation also found that the day after he went missing, someone used his phone to check his voicemail. I don't remember there ever not being a code that you had to get into your voicemail. Does anyone remember in older phones that you could just call it? 
we do know that there was a message there from his landlord about the overdue rent. There seems to be some implication that one of the voicemails from the landlord was checked after he went missing, but it's not specifically clear. And because this one isn't accurate from story to story, I'm kind of hesitant to believe that. However, it was said that the landlord, Brett Bishop, was kind of a sketchy character. He'd left messages between the 13th and the 16th over a dozen times. But of course, people have a right to expect their rent too, so that doesn't necessarily mean anything. But this man was apparently no stranger to the police. He had been charged in the past with possessing drugs and illegal firearms. He'd also stolen vehicles and committed some kind of a fraud. Stephen's father was concerned that perhaps he was involved with something nefarious involving Bishop. But Bishop himself has never been named as a person of interest. Stephen's father had drug-sniffing dogs go over to his son's house, but the dogs didn't alert on any narcotics at all. There's no indication he'd been making the kind of money that comes from selling them. While there is a mystery as to where he was driving, especially since money was so tight, it doesn't appear that the narcotics were involved at all. At least no proof was found of this. More searching was done of the area in 2015, but no evidence of what happened to him was ever found. The police would say they have found no evidence of foul play. His parents, for their part, are positive he would never take his own life or disappear forever. Unfortunately, his father passed in 2011 without ever knowing what happened. Stephen was 5 foot 10 and 180 pounds when he went missing. He had blonde hair and blue eyes. He would be 43 if he's alive today. Stephen Kocher has been missing for 13 years. Damien Sharp Missing from Warren, Pennsylvania. Damien Sharp was dropped off at a Memorial Day party on March 25, 2002. This was the last time he was seen. Two days would pass, and his roommates would tell Sharp's mother that he was missing, and a missing person report was filed. There's been zero indication as to what happened to him. I wanted to say a big thank you for suggesting this case. This is one of those I never would have picked otherwise. It didn't have very much information, and because of this, probably not a lot of people have covered it. We do know that Warren was on crutches that day, and he had something wrong with his leg. He had a tattoo of an Egyptian onk on his chest. It doesn't say what branch of the armed forces he was in, though his photo does seem to indicate he was a member of the service. We do know that Sharp's father was killed in an auto accident several years after his son disappeared without ever knowing what happened, but the rest of his family still searches for him. Damien was 22 when he went missing. He's been missing for 20 years. He'd be 42 years old today. The link to his Facebook page is found in the description below. Donna K. Cloud from Splendora, Texas Donna Cloud was last seen in Splendora, on October 25th, 2016, she had a small son and a complicated relationship with her family. In fact, her parents didn't raise her. It was her grandparents that this responsibility fell to. What relationship there was with her family, it was strained. Her mother had dropped her off with her grandparents and didn't return. She was just an infant at the time. At 14, Donna tried to begin a relationship and meet her mother, but after making the appointment, her mother didn't bother to even show up. Donna would eventually have a child of her own and do her best to be the parent she didn't have. However, she did end up with some struggles, it seems. For instance, it appears she was hospitalized on an overdose within that last year. She was trying to make a go of it, and she finally hooked back up with her father, who she hadn't had a relationship with either. She then moved in with him, and it didn't go smoothly. On the day in question, he would tell the police she left home to go on a blind date and never returned. This wasn't true. The truth is that her father had gotten in a disagreement with her and at one point ordered her to leave. Whether he was hiding something he did or he felt accidentally complicit and was trying to get himself off the hook, it's hard to say. Her father would claim she went to a restaurant 
and that she called him after to say how great the date went. But security would show she never went to that restaurant, and it's not believed there ever was a date. It's believed that two men picked her up from her home that night, but one of the men claims he dropped her off safely the same night at her house. I don't think that can be proven either. It was late night on October 25th, or perhaps early hours of the 26th. She had accepted friendship requests on Facebook from two men. Donna's search history makes it clear she was looking for a couple of specific people, although it's not clear if these men were the ones she was searching for. They were twice her age, and if a Reddit post is true, one of them had been in jail with Donna's father, Daryl. This case is super confusing. There are only snippets of proof and a lot of suspects. I had to completely rewrite this twice to try to make it as clear as possible, but it's not super clear now. In hopes of making it easier to follow, I decided not to do it in chronological order, as I did when I was originally researching and started to write it up. Instead, I'm going to divide it by suspect and see if that makes more sense. Just a quick background. She was likely thrown out of her house by her father that day, and she may or may not have gone out with two guys twice her age that she hooked up with on Facebook. We know she left without her child, money, or clothing. It's also known that a ping came from her phone, and it was recorded in Houston, Texas. She had been threatened by her ex, as well as by another man named K-Dub and his girlfriend. We also know that Donna had been hospitalized with an overdose a while back. So there's a lot of things happening, and it's really hard to say exactly what it was. Suspect one in her disappearance is her father. He would tell the police she went on a blind date, called him to say how fun it was, and that she was going to date him again the next night. However, she didn't have any money or clothing with her. The restaurant he claimed she had gone to had surveillance video and she wasn't there. This was later categorized in an article as saying he blatantly lied. Additionally, he would claim they had argued over her ex-boyfriend who was abusive implying the only reason she fought with him was that he was looking out for her. That would be proven false because she made a post on Facebook earlier that day, telling everyone that her dad wanted $400 immediately for her to continue staying with him in his home, and shared that she thought she might be going to lose her home if she didn't pay. There are also allegations that her father was super controlling around her son, if they went out together, he wouldn't even let her push the child's stroller, which doesn't really prove anything, but it's a little strange. There is a comment by someone who knew her saying he tried to keep her away from her son whenever he could, but that Donna was young and just doing the best that she could. Her father seems to have done a fair amount of projecting the problem with Donna's disappearance to being how unfair it is to him rather than his child or grandchild. He gave an interview seven months after she went missing, talking about how the unsolved case is tearing his life apart. He was also approached by someone on Facebook, and from what I could tell, he thought for a moment that she'd been found, although she had not. This was his post, and that too doesn't make him look great. He would go on to call his missing daughter a spoiled brat and claimed she had essentially ruined his life by making him drive his vehicle into the ground while looking for her, that she caused him to lose his job, and he was upset at her being missing. It does appear by his harshness that he does seem to believe she had been found. If he thought she was found alive, then it might be an indication that he did not do anything to her, even though it seems to look bad for him. But that said, his response wasn't relief that she was okay. It was anger which is strange in its own way. But not being a great dad is one thing. It doesn't prove that he did anything to her. And his response does seem to back up that he did think she was alive. Suspect 2, Carter Meyer. Carter was a drug dealer who had been in jail with Donna's father. He was twice Donna's age. He would admit later to the police that he picked her up and dropped her off in the same place. He refused to take a polygraph. But because of the problems with the polygraph test, it doesn't necessarily mean guilt when somebody won't take one. It appears the man he was with was his roommate, and the two men had bounced in and out of jail for years. A witness would come forward saying he saw a girl get into a dark SUV with two guys. 
it's believed the other man is the man named Aubrey Schultz. Schultz was not a great guy either. He reportedly stabbed a man just for being homosexual. There are reasons as to why the police seem to let it go and have taken the men at their word. There is a Reddit thread that, if true, nails down some calls and internet history that appears to have been done by a family member. It refers to a Find Donna website, but the site is no longer active. I've linked that Reddit thread in the comments below. Suspect 3. The Abusive Ex-Boyfriend The police willingly reached out to him, and he willingly took a lie detector test, and he reportedly passed. He seems the less likely suspect of all of them. Suspect 4. A man known as K-Dub. Seen here. This is a TikTok put out by Donna's family, and there is a link to the site I got it from. Team Donna K in the links below. He reportedly left her a threatening message the day after she went missing. According to the Reddit thread put out by one of her family members, the proof of her movement seemed to go like this. October 25, 2016. Donna turns on her Facebook location tracker, and her first location is recorded after 9 p.m., and she Googled Snapchat in unlimited notepad. She apparently used the notepad to write to her father, and then she searched Snapchat again. The last time anyone ever saw her is listed as the 26th. Digitally, a lot happened that same night, October 27, 2016. At 12.51 a.m., she did a Facebook search for two friends. Google searches at 1.07 a.m. searched out the word spectrum, and at 2.49 a.m. searched out Hillary Clinton Heckler. At 4.41 a.m. through 6.49 a.m., she was sending DMs. These DMs went between her and Kyle Ferguson, also known as K-Dubs, who she was talking to before her disappearance. They were flirting back and forth, which I believe ended with his girlfriend Amanda threatening to harm Donna. It is reported that he at some point then also threatened her. There was no one answering her phone or replying to her family, but there were searches done on her phone after she went missing. And her family believes they weren't done by Donna. On November 3, 2016, at 12.12 12 p.m., there was a search for climate control hoax. Five days later, on November 8th, another one was Prius driver's meme. Five more days later, searches happened, and I think they make more sense if someone reads them than me trying to do so. It appears to me that whoever was using her phone had a pickup. It appears that person was looking for tires and was researching military tires. I wish I knew if she was at all political or right-wing, as it appears the person using her phone was right-wing as he or she did the search. That might help indicate if it was actually her on the phone. The next search is perhaps more concerning. On November 30th, 2016, a search was performed at VesselFinder.com. This is a site that lets you know when a boat will be in port. The Reddit post questioned whether or not this was about drugs. I would add that doesn't mean it's not about trafficking either. I will play an audio of him threatening her that was released on Facebook, but I'm not sure what time the message happened. This was the message left from K-Dub for Donna on her phone. It makes little to no sense. I did my best to write what I think he said on the screen, but I spent entirely too much time on this message and I couldn't find where anyone had transcribed it before. It's really not great. I couldn't tell what he was saying.
I couldn't play the audio as I found it because he kept using the N-word. It looks like he responded here, as you can see, using his wife's Facebook to allegations made by Missing in Texas on their post regarding her going missing. I don't know exactly where this message showed up or what took place, but her family and friends have posted this on social media. Donna was 19 when she went missing. If she is still alive, she is 25 today. She has a number of tattoos, and there is a diamond ring that she wore on her right finger, a cross on her right index finger, the words love is enough on her collarbone, the word faith in cursive on the inside of her forearm, a tattoo of a crown on the inside of her forearm, and script writing on her back on her right shoulder blade, reading, God is within her, she will not fail. Psalms 46 5. When she was last seen, she was 5 foot tall to 5'2 and 95 to 133 pounds. This is a wide estimate for someone of her height. Both cheeks have deep dimples, and she was around both Conroe, Texas, and Houston. There's a link in the description to a petition for a new detective on this case as well as to Facebook and Instagram sites dedicated to her case. Donna K. Cloud has been missing for six years. She has a nine-year-old child that needs to know where his mom is. If she is still alive, she would be 25 today. Please call the number on your screen if you know anything at all about this case. Caitlin Avril Murray, missing from Quinell, British Columbia. On September 30th, 2013, 21-year-old Caitlin was caught by cameras going to the Fraser Footbridge in Quinell, British Columbia. Cameras caught her parking near that bridge. There is a camera in the middle of the bridge, but it was non-operational at the time. It's known that she arrived at approximately 12.45 a.m. Caitlin was feeling pretty depressed after a recent breakup with someone she had been dating for a long time. She was pretty open that she wasn't in a good place when she went to the bridge that day, but she'd been texting two friends, and at the time she wrote that she was considering jumping. Quinell RCMP, the Search and Rescue, and Air Services all began searching around the footbridge, the Fraser River, the surrounding banks, park, forest. Despite the rigorous search, she remains missing. It would come out later that 45 minutes after her other text, though, she had texted her friends to say she was no longer considering jumping, she was feeling better, and she was going to go home and go to bed. That was just it. No one ever saw her again. She was about five feet tall and had blonde hair and blue eyes. She wasn't caught on camera leaving, and her car stayed where it was. So did she jump? Did she maybe accidentally fall? Or did somebody else meet her on that bridge and do something? Her parents are on record saying they don't believe she jumped. And of course, her text indicated that she changed her mind. In the past, anyone who jumped, as others have, their remains were always found. Additionally, Caitlin had just graduated from the College of New Chalcedonia and she was to begin working as a healthcare worker. Her parents have gone on record saying that they believe the fact that she considered suicide has been a convenient excuse for not investigating her disappearance. Without having a working camera on the bridge, it can't be ruled out that someone came upon her before she left. The area itself is one that has been known to have drug addicts inhabiting the area. They were clear that it was a pretty good area if somebody was going to target someone. The camera on the bridge has been fixed, thanks in part to Caitlin's family, as they applied pressure on the community in order to replace it. Even if someone targeted her there and something happened, it would be more likely she would have gone over the bridge despite searching the water and the surrounding area. Caitlin wasn't found there. Caitlin's ex had assaulted her prior to the breakup and he had charges pending. Those charges were dropped as Caitlin didn't show up in court. The contact number for her case is displayed here. Caitlin Avril Murray has been missing for nine years. If she's still alive, 
she would be 30 years old today. Amy B. Schur, missing from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Amy Schur was very close to her family when she began dating Robert Desmond in the 1990s. However, Desmond was extremely controlling and rude to her family members. He would eventually begin placing abusive calls to her and her family, and it got so bad that members felt they had to obtain restraining orders to make it stop. And as they had much proof as to this, they were granted the restraining orders. But Amy chose to stay with Robert, and as a result, contact ended with her and her family. The years would wind on, but her family never forgot or stopped worrying about Amy. From the best I can tell, they live in Michigan. They would hire a private investigator who would try to track her down. She was living in Massachusetts, and the investigator would stop to speak with her in the parking lot of her job at the Leahy Clinic in Burlington, Massachusetts. She would go home that day, October 14, 2002, saying she didn't feel very well. She would call in sick to work for the next two days, and she did this herself. On the third day, however, it was her husband, Robert Desmond, who called to say she was too sick to come to work. He also inquired as to the boss's email. The reason he would give is that Amy had an email she wanted to send him, but she was unable to do it herself. He did email the clinic attaching a resignation letter that is alleged to have been written by Amy herself. Her supervisor, however, was adamant that it wasn't her signature on the letter at all, and this was the last the clinic would hear from her. In fact, she had one paycheck left, and that paycheck would go uncollected. Her supervisor would say she had a terrible feeling about this. It was apparently common knowledge at her job how she was treated by her husband. As a result, her employer contacted the police. In response, the police would search out her husband, Robert Desmond. Her husband would claim to the police that the last time he saw Amy was the fourth day after she left work. He claimed Amy decided to quit her job, leave her car behind, and instead chose to have him drop her off at a train station in Cambridge, Massachusetts at noon. He would say he watched her leave, but it was amicable, and this was the last time he spoke to her. Although this wasn't typical of her behavior, nor was the suggestion that her husband was even capable of being amicable. All they had, though, was suspicion. While there's no proof that she took a train, and also nothing to indicate anything other than what Robert Desmond claimed, even though nothing about this sounded logical. They found no evidence suggesting he'd hurt her, but the entire claim of his didn't ring true either, especially to those who knew her. It turns out that Desmond's treatment of Amy was always in question. Her family didn't care for how he treated her, and this was at the core from everything that happened to separate her from her family. Eighteen months would pass before her family would push back harder after the police initially looked at the case. They would be the ones to file the missing person report. Her co-worker was still concerned also, explaining her husband was seen as controlling and abusive. In fact, he required Amy to provide her whereabouts at any and every given moment. He exerted complete control over her and her behavior so it's even more out of character that he would just let her walk away and be okay with it. To her co-workers, nothing sounded right about that story. Those co-workers would allege that Desmond had a really violent temper and he was abusive. And this had been going on for years. The authorities, for their part, were convinced she didn't just leave. Her driver's license lapsed, and it was never renewed. It's not clear if her husband ever tried to explain why she took a train to leave when she had a car. Nor is it clear what happened to the car itself, but it's noted the licensing for that Pontiac would also lapse. She had a degree in engineering and hospital maintenance. Her social security work history would indicate she had not worked since she went missing. Her co-workers would open up saying that the days before she disappeared, she was covered with bruises and there was one injury a while back that led them to believe her husband may have broken her back. She would show up with clumps of hair missing, bruises. Sometimes she would be limping. 
it became common knowledge at work that she was being abused, and they would report that they heard her crying over the phone when talking to him. It was clear there was a real problem. The police would question him multiple times over the years, and his story would always change. There was the possibility of convening a grand jury at one point, and Robert Desmond was adamant that he wouldn't allow his son to testify, and as his remaining parent, it appears he had that right. So it's not clear what the boy might know. Amy's family would never meet her son, Michael. They went to court for visitation rights and won them, but before they could use those rights to see Michael, his father took the boy and fled to California. Amy was 38 years old at the time of her disappearance and described as 5'6 and 110 pounds. She had brown hair and hazel eyes. Her son, Michael, was either 6 when she went missing or when her family won visitation. Michael would likely be about 26 to 28 today. Hopefully the father's behavior wasn't directed at him and that his life has been okay. Hopefully he will one day connect with his grandparents if he hasn't yet. Amy Schur has been missing for 20 years. If she's still alive, she would be 58 today. Jacob Ryan Loomis, missing from Kalispell, Montana. Jacob Loomis was 24 and was last seen on 9th Avenue in Kalispell, Montana. The 5'8", 120-pound man was last seen with his girlfriend Nikki and best friend Skylar in October of 2019. The three of them had planned to travel to go hunting, likely around Eureka or Libby, Montana. He was actually from Oregon, and he'd moved to Montana just a few months earlier. He was staying at the Samaritan House, which is both a homeless shelter and a transitional living center. And reportedly, things seemed to have been looking up for Jacob. People found that he had a solid work ethic, and he was working two jobs to get back on his feet and to get his life here in Montana on track. It's noted that in addition to being five foot eight. With brown hair and brown eyes, Jacob had a Celtic tattoo that can be seen here. His pinky finger was injured at the time of his disappearance. The suspicious part of this case is that the two people he was with, whose names are reported to be Skylar and Nikki, have refused to speak to the police about where he might be. And because he had a solid work ethic, it wasn't like him to skip out on his jobs. And he left all of his belongings behind. If Jacob is still alive, he would be 27. Jacob Loomis has been missing for three years. His parents are desperate for any information. Please contact the number given. Leah Roberts, missing from Whatcom County, Washington. Leah Roberts was born in 1976 in Durham, North Carolina. Not long before she graduated from high school, her father would develop a chronic lung disease. As her father began fighting his battle to live, in 1995, she would begin to attend North Carolina State University, both studying and playing soccer for the school. She would have to leave the university just a year later, as her mother would die suddenly from heart disease. It was a lot at once, but bad things still kept happening. She returned to college in 1998, but then she got in a serious car crash. She would shatter her femur, requiring a metal rod to be put in to stabilize her leg. She also punctured a lung, but she recovered, and with that, she got a new lease on life. She would later tell her sister, Kara, that when she saw the truck she was about to collide with, that she believed she was going to die, saying that the fact that this didn't happen made her feel born again. Leah began soul-searching. In 1999, Leah decided a trip to Costa Rica was what she needed. But as she prepared for this trip, her father passed away. She decided to stop putting off her life and decided to still take that trip, which was at this time three months away. She would give her sister power of attorney to handle her bills and keep preparing. She took the trip as planned. By now, Leah was really close to graduating with a degree in Spanish and anthropology. It's described that she has six months left of study. And though she was close to graduating, she decided to drop out, something that her family wasn't thrilled about. Her brother pushed her to keep going, and she was adamant that she was done. She was fascinated by a book called The Dharma Bus. The author writes of his journey to Washington's Desolation Peak 
and it was a journey Leah wanted to take. She adopted a kitten that she would name B, and she began the journey on her own. The lookout isn't publicly available to hike any longer, but it had been. The hike is on a trail that offers views of Ross Lake, eventually climbing into the mountains, culminating in a peak that's about 4,400 feet high. You could see the Jack Mountains and Hosamine Mountain in Canada. The view used to end in the lookout. Leah had embarked on a journey of self-discovery, paying her way with the funds she inherited from her parents' passing. She took up photography and began writing poetry. She was excited to have a plan and the ability to follow in her favorite author's footsteps, and she hopefully planned to rediscover herself along the way. The morning of March 9, 2000, everything seemed pretty normal. Leah was in her apartment in North Carolina. She seemed totally fine when she talked to her sister, Kara, on the phone. They didn't have a specific date, but they set up a plan to get together soon. Leah spoke later that day to her roommate, and the two women made plans to babysit together the following day for some unnamed child. The roommate, Nicole, left for work the same day, and when she returned, Leah wasn't home. Leah's 1993 Jeep Cherokee was also gone, but she didn't think much of it, at least not until the following day when Leah failed to show up at the given time at the babysitting job. By now, the roommate, Nicole, was getting worried. It wasn't like Leah to flake on her. The following day was the 11th. This was two days after the plan to babysit had been made, as well as the conversation between Leah and her sister that ended with those two planning to get together. Her disappearance made zero sense. Nicole reached out to her sister, and on the fourth day, March 13th, Leah Roberts was reported missing. On March 14th, Kara and Nicole decided to search Leah's room. They would find a note written by Leah. It contained a one-line reading, I'm not suicidal, I'm the opposite. It also referenced Leah's fascination with the book Dharma Bus, as well as a drawing of a Cheshire cat smile on the paper. There was also a pile of cash. The amount was set to cover one month of Leah's share of rent and living expenses. It was really strange, and a lot of Leah's belongings were gone. The fact that she left cash for rent made the two women believe she was coming back. The cat that she had just adopted, named B, was also gone. Her sister Kara would realize that she still had the power of attorney regarding Leah's account, and she could thankfully use this to check on her bank. She was able to check to see if Leah was spending money and where she would discover that Leah had withdrawn several thousand dollars. In addition to the cash she was carrying, she had used her debit card to pay for a motel room outside of Memphis, Tennessee on March 9th. That was that first day, the day that she disappeared. So she got that far and got a hotel room the first night. After that first day, she purchased gas along Interstate 40. The last time she pulled money was from her account on March 13th. By then, she had reached Brooks, Oregon. They caught her on CCTV, and they were able to tell that she was healthy and seemed fine, which was a huge relief. Leah went on to make a series of purchases, all of food or gas, and it indicated that she was traveling west along Interstate 40 before turning north on Interstate 5, when she reached the western end of Interstate 40. The last activity on Leah's accounts occurred in the early morning hours of March 13th in Brooks, Oregon. CCTV footage showed her at the gas station purchasing gas. She was alone and appeared to be in good health, although she did keep looking out into the car park as she made a transaction. It seemed pretty clear that she wasn't in trouble, and she had set out to travel alone. Although it seems pretty bizarre to leave without saying why, as well as traveling so very far with a kitten in the car. The plan didn't seem very clear, but they were a little more relaxed as to what was happening. Then on March 18th, Leah's car was found wrecked and abandoned off the side of a logging road in Whatcom County, Washington. After speaking to some of Leah's friends, Kara came to the conclusion that she had most likely left of her own accord and was planning to go on a trip soul-searching and then return home. But then something must have happened. Items of her clothing were seen tied along the way from where her vehicle was found. They were tied on trees and around the woods. 
The vehicle itself was damaged pretty badly. It was estimated that she was going about 40 miles an hour when she went off the road and went down a really steep embankment. The area was actually pretty close to her destination, assuming she had planned to go to the Overlook mentioned in the book she loves so much, the Dharma Bus. It's impossible to know what her plan was, if her cat was still with her, if she took her along when she disappeared from the car or just let her out. She did have cat food and a carrier inside of the vehicle. The items in the car were thrown all around, but it was pretty clear it had rolled and the movement of the items were consistent with that. There was zero blood noted anywhere. She had a blanket placed over the glass from the broken window. It doesn't appear she had a cell phone. They weren't as common then. Maybe one in three people had them in the year 2000. Without a cell phone, she might have been hurt or felt she was in trouble and went to get help. The weird thing, though, is that her belongings are scattered in the woods in a way that didn't seem to be about marking trees or locations. Obviously, clothes on trees could be about marking a location. However, there were things strewn about like CDs. Her checkbook was found outside with checks still inside. And even more alarming, a pair of pants were abandoned that had $2,500 inside of the pocket. Her passport, too, was found outside the vehicle. Her mother's engagement ring meant more to Leah than anything she owned, and it was found under the passenger side floor mat. There was no blood found at all inside of the vehicle. The fact that the ring was found was shocking to her family, as they didn't think she would have taken it off voluntarily. Another weird thing is there were no signs of the wreck as far as a stretched safety belt or blood if she wasn't buckled in. A man would call later to tell authorities that he and his wife saw a woman they think was Leah, saying she was at a Texaco station in Everett, Washington. He spoke to her and she was confused, saying she wasn't sure who she was. However, the man hung up before giving his own contact information. The police were pretty sure he was being honest. However, there was no way to question him again. The police would begin to work on a theory that she was trying to walk to her destination walking toward the Mount Baker Highway, possibly being picked up by a passing motorist. Her vehicle would be towed and held onto. It was examined and it was found inside that someone had cut a wire that would cause the car to accelerate, even if someone was not pushing the gas pedal, which might explain why there was no signs of her having been inside the car. She likely wasn't. They believe the blanket on the windshield makes sense if it was being set up to look like someone crawled out. But nothing explains the items found outside the vehicle. Did Leah leave the ring under the mat as a clue? But if someone else was involved, why would they leave the cash? It just nothing makes sense. They went back with helicopters and scanned the area. They also went back with cadaver dogs. And they also, as well as metal detectors. The metal detector was in hopes of finding the metal rod that was in Leah's leg. None of it turned up anything. This is yet another one that isn't very logical and there aren't any clear answers. When Leah Roberts went missing, she had sandy blonde hair, blue eyes, a beauty mark on the right side of her face near her upper lip, a rod in her right femur, and dimples. She was a cigarette smoker, a vegetarian, and 5 foot 6 inches tall. She spoke with a southern accent, and she also spoke fluent Spanish. Leah Roberts has been missing for nearly 22 years. She was 23 years old when she went missing and would be 45 years old today.
As always, thank you so much for watching. Please consider subscribing and hitting the bell so you don't miss new episodes. So if you enjoy the content here and you're not sure, take a peek to see if you're subscribed. Take care of yourselves and each other.